the best. Here he goes. And George Best sets a club scoring record. I consider myself an entertainer. Uh, I mean, I, th I think it was a big part of football, and I always tried to entertain people. I, th I mean, it was show business as far as I was concerned. Georgie, Georgie, they call you the Belfast boy. Georgie, Georgie, they call you the Belfast boy. And they said, Georgie, Georgie, keep your feet on the ground. Georgie, Georgie, when you listen to the sound. Georgie, Georgie, put a light on your name. Hey, 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 play the game. Play the game. You won't have long in the limelight No, you won't have many days When you live and you play for United With your life and your blood and your soul You run and you kick and you fight it And you learn every way to the goal Georgie, Georgie They call you the Belfast boy Georgie, Georgie They call you the Belfast joy And they say, Georgie, Georgie Keep your feet on the ground Georgie, Georgie When you listen to the sound Hello from Windsor Park in Belfast. The stadium behind me empty as you can see on a date when it should have been packed for the George Best testimonial. But as you'll probably know, the IFA vetoed that game. However, fresh approaches have been made. As I understand it, the IFA could have a rethink so the game could eventually get the go-ahead. No game tonight then, but rather than disappoint you, coming up plenty of goals, plenty of highlights, and a host of personalities as we take a look at the life and times of one of the world's greatest ever players. Bobby Charlton, United moving forward again, Manchester there, George Best with a lot of room to work, Gibbons on his right, Best again, a glorious goal by Best, what a magnificent goal by Best! Brian Kidd, to George Best, Fitzpatrick, Best going in on it. Best! Oh, beautifully taken by Best! What a magnificent goal by Best! George Best, for whom the word superstar could almost have been invented. A Pied Piper who attracted thousands to watch his unique artistry. Sadly, he was to become an enigma, unable to cope with his genius. A glittering career at the top was ended prematurely, and recent headlines have centred on his continuous battle against a drink problem. Many have said he wasted his talent, yet he's achieved much more than most people think. In 1968, he was named European Footballer of the Year, English Player of the Year, and helped Manchester United win the European Cup. He also won two league championship medals, as United won the first division title in 1965 and 1967. A 15-year-old best joined United as an amateur in 1961. In May 1963, he signed professional forms. In September that year, he made his first team debut. In all, he was to spend almost 11 years at Old Trafford, playing a total of 464 first-team games, scoring 178 goals. Indeed, he's the last United player to score over 20 league goals in a season. It was a dream come true for me. Well, it would have been for any kid. You know, 15 years old, uh, basically for someone to just come up to you and, and say, you want to play for Manchester United? <laughs> it was, uh, you know, it was, uh, well, you can't really describe how it was. And almost immediately, you know, uh, within sort of 18 months, you know, two years, I was I was in the first team. You know, at the same time playing in the youth team, I was I was playing in in Europe basically. It was uh, it was tremendous, yeah. And the the fact that I played with with so many great players was uh, was the icing on the cake. Manchester United manager during those glory days in the 60s was Matt Busby. Having survived the Munich air disaster in February 1958, when eight of United's team perished, Busby was in the process of building yet another great side, when Best arrived at Old Trafford in the early 60s. The Belfast boy would eventually cause his manager many problems, but the early days were blissful, and 20 years on, Best is still glowing in his praise of Busby, as both man and manager. A genius in both He's, one, he's, I was going to say, one of the nicest. He's probably the nicest human being I've ever met. He's one of those people. I mean, I remember my father going to Old Trafford for the first time, and he treated him like he was a king. 
And the next time he went back, my father, he remembered his name, he remembered the name of the kids, he remembered what he drank, where he lived. He just had this talent for making people feel at home. And it wasn't just because he was my father, he did it with everybody. Uh, and as a manager, I mean, he wanted football to be played the way it should be played. I mean, we didn't have team talks. He just gave us a ball and said, go out and enjoy yourself. I suppose he could do it with the players he had. He not only was a great player, he was a great lad at one time. Very, very good. He was very, very good, actually, and, and very helpful. And uh, in, even in his early days, when I used to ask him to go and play with some young boys and that type of thing, he used to join in. And, and when I'd say, I think he's had enough, he'd say, no, it's all right, boss. Yeah, we'll carry on. And, and uh, this, is, this was George at that time, and he was very, very good. When you look back, do you now regret having given him a few bad times? No, because I give him more good times than I ever give him bad times. You know, I, I look back and uh, at the end of the day, uh, I happen to believe that I was, uh, let's say, a major help in winning him Euro win the European Cup. And it was something he dreamed about. So I think, I happen to believe that I helped fulfill a dream for him. And I think if you ask him himself, he'll tell you that all the bad times, he'd forget for that one moment. The cup they wanted was the European Cup. A hundred thousand expectant fans packed the stands to see great football. Bobby Charlton and Coluna exchanged Manchester United and Benfica pennants. The moment of truth in the battle for mastery of European soccer had arrived. United playing in blue kicked off. United launched directly into attack. Bobby Charlton took the ball into Benfica territory. Dangerous moments as the Portuguese defence tried to clear. Now Benfica came away. That mighty danger man Eusebio sent in a scorcher. It ricocheted off the crossbar. What an escape! Stepney unrattled, collected the return effort, and got United moving. George Best fell foul of the first of a series of savage tackles which marred the first half. Best again with the ball. He seemed to be a target for the stop them at any cost Benfica defence, but Italian referee Lobello let that one go. Benfica had the advantage, but made a stonewall United rearguard. Charlton was very unhappy with the ref's decision, and the visitors, too, had plenty to say for themselves. Benfica with the dangerous free kick. But what a great keeper Stepney proved himself. It was near the end of an unglamorous first half. No score by either side. With the eyes of the world on both teams and the hopes of every Briton behind United, the second half got underway. The Busby boys seemed fired with a new enthusiasm and stormed into the attack. United's football was full of fire. Enrique had to concede a corner to keep that one out. George Best was in terrific form, but so was Enrique. Benfica weren't going to let United run away with the match. They, too, showed they meant business. On the showing so far, United were proving the better side. Hard-working best put the ball out to the left, where Sadler had been playing like a demon. The return centre was a beauty. Charlton headed it home. What a tonic for the fans. United one up in the 55th minute and going all out for another one. The match was by no means won. Benfica pulled off a beauty through Grasa. One all and time running out. Stepney was a wonder goalkeeper to stop that rocket from the big cannon boot of Eusebio and the great Portuguese star sportingly acknowledged it. But that wasn't it. 90 minutes up and still deadlocked. The teams were weary but the fans went. 
With an extra 30 minutes of play ahead, Bunt's bruises and tired muscles ached like they'd never ached before. But a wet sponge and a magic massage worked miracles. And so on into the first half of extra time. And what a 15 minutes it was. Stepney collected and fed his forwards. Waiting to receive was mighty best. He simply walked the ball into the net. What a goal! United in the lead. And that wasn't all. The Busby Babes were raring to go. They hammered Benfica. Watch this fantastic goal. My, oh, my, how they cheered Kid, the birthday boy, for that super header. Even Stepney joined in. The Benfica fire had nearly been extinguished. But where United finished, not on your life. Bobby Charlton made it 4-1. Manchester United had well and truly done it. They were supreme soccer champions of Europe. At last, Matt Busby, the maestro of Manchester United, had groomed a team great enough to beat Europe's best. He was king of soccer. His wonderful 11 men were all princes. After the game, I, I felt an anticlimax because it was all over. And uh, the following couple of seasons, it became more of an anticlimax because the team really was on the slide, really. I mean, when you look four years later, they were in the second division. So that's what I was trying to say. I could see that it was a little bit, you know, when it happened, it was, it was, it was the greatest thing that ever happened to the club. Uh, but after that was an anticlimax because it should have it should have kept going. You know, we should have done a Liverpool. We should have kept winning trophies, winning the league, winning European Cups, and we didn't. We went the opposite, which for a club the size of Manchester United was a little bit frightening when you look at it. I mean, they're still my club. I still think of them as my club. Winning the European Cup in 1968 was the pinnacle of success for that superb United team. They also won the first division title twice. It was the era of George Best, Dennis Law and Bobby Charlton, three of the greatest individual players ever to grace the British game. A brilliant trio who enthralled packed grounds everywhere with skill and entertainment you won't find in the modern game. Dennis Law had joined United from Italian club Torino in 1962 for the then staggering fee of £115,000. The swashbuckling Scottish striker quickly became the king at Old Trafford. He recalls seeing the young pretender to his crown for the first time. Well, of course, he was only a young boy. I think he came with another Irish lad, uh, and I just joined United. Of course, they were building just uh, after the Munich disaster, and I saw him in the gym down at our training ground in Salford, two uh, young boys and absolutely tremendous skill. As I say, United building up after the crash. We had had a bad start to the season, and we nearly went down that season, but in 63, and I remember the game here, it was at Old Trafford, and I didn't play, I was in the stand with so Matt Busby and uh, George placed against West Brom, and it was absolutely magnificent. It really was the start of the sort of side that United had in that 60s, of being a great side, with the likes of uh, Bobby Charlton, Nobby Styles, Pat Creran, uh, David Herd, and of course this young lad who had come from Northern Ireland, young... I mean, when I came down from England, I was thin as well, I think I weighed about eight stone. I think Bessie <laughs> weighed about seven stone. But uh, you could see that he had, he had everything. He had the skill, he was brave, he was good in the air. I mean, it sounds all cliches, you know, but he was good with both feet, he was brave. He scored goals, he, uh, he never stopped running. Ma magnificent player. Had he any weaknesses at all? Can't think of any. Uh, probably after, in the sort of, uh, the middle 60s going on towards the late 60s, when we really were a very, very good side. And we went to um, Benfica. We had taken a 3-2 lead. They were one of the great sides, probably the, the greatest side in Europe at that time. And we went there and we beat them 5-1. And Bestie had an absolutely magnificent game. And of course, it was the time of the Beatles as well. And he was a good looking guy, black hair, the long hair, uh, single. And after that game, of course, he was called, I think it was El Beatle or whatever it was, you know. And he just, if it was a weakness in him, he, he maybe at that time just began to be a little bit greedy. You know, sometimes he would beat, he always beat three or four men, but he was trying to beat five or six. So if it was a weakness, it maybe it was around that time that maybe he should have passed the ball when, when he, earlier on. But uh, it, it, that weakness is not uh, a weakness as such. It is uh, just maybe a little bit greedy, but 
which, <laughs> but of course, when at times, you know, I mean, he would. We would. Do you know football? You know, just when, a bit. well, just when, a bit. when you're messing about in there and you knock a ball out, and Bestie's got it, and he was on the flanks, and he would beat one or two, and the ball should be yours, you know. And he'd say, "Hey, Bestie, come on, let's give it to me." And he he would beat another one, and he'd say, "Yeah, bang it in the back of the net," you know. So he'd say, "You little." B <laughs> <laughs> Was he a complex person at all? There's a, I mean, Bestie's had. Um, as you are in, in the public eye, you are, get a tremendous amount of publicity. And sometimes, and a, and a great many of the times, of course, it's uh, not good. You know, and we've seen Bestie over the last 10 or 20 years, you know, had uh, adverse publicity. But the one thing that people don't know, the people who know him do, and he is a terrific lad. He, he is a lovely lad. And he has no, he doesn't do any harm to anybody. He does a lot of good stuff, which is never really uh, taken out and come out in the media, whether it be television, radio, or the, or the press. And that's the one thing that a lot of people don't know about Bessie. They think he's a sort of, you know, sort of star, a big, and he's, uh, you know, he's always out doing the, sort of the wrong things. But George Bess is a lovely, lovely lad. But I, when I got in the team, I, I played exactly the same as I did when I was a kid. You know, I didn't want to give the ball away, you know, because, uh, you know, I, was, <laughs> I suppose I was better than the, the other kids. And I tended to play the same way in the first division. And uh, at times, I mean, like they, they used to pull their hair out, both him and Bobby, you know, uh, because I was, I suppose, basically playing the same as I'd always played. Uh, that, of course, changed with, you know, a little bit of experience, you know. He became a little bit less selfish. Uh, but I can understand it, you know, because I know what I used to do. I and mean, if I beat a player six times, I wanted to come back and beat him seven times. Uh, so I can understand their frustration. Completing that priceless threesome was Bobby Charlton. 106 times he played for England and was a key member of the England team which won the World Cup in 1966. At Manchester United, he's something of an institution. As a player, after surviving the Munich air crash, he went on to serve the club for 16 years, playing in over 600 games. Today, he's still at Old Trafford as a club director. The legend is that the, the two of you didn't get on and you didn't turn up to play in this testimonial. Yet he said nice things to me about you. What was the relationship like with Bobby Charlton? OK, I mean, on the field, you know, we were teammates. And uh, I think if you watch any old film clips and, and, and shots of the games, you know, if he scored, I was the first there to congratulate him and vice versa, you know, because we, we played in the same team and uh, we, were, we were playing for the, the same end product. Uh, but off the field, you know, he had his way of living and I had my way. You know, he was a family man, he went home to the family and I went out and got, uh, you know, <laughs> and uh, so socially we didn't mix and that was it. Well, I, I mean, George was a different age group for me. Uh, people, people used to say to me, you know, that you weren't, you, you didn't get on with George. I, said, I, I got on with George Biss quite all right. Uh, it was just that we were a different age group. I, I didn't go out with him because I went home. You know, I wasn't the lad that went out to nightclubs. I, I didn't drink particularly much. I had my own pals. Um, but uh, people who are a lot closer would probably answer that question better. Um, looking at it really from the outside, I would, I would have to say really that some people whose intentions were very well-meaning with regard to George's own well-being, um, really, uh, he didn't listen to. He listened to the wrong type of people, I think. Old Trafford at that time, with all the players, he was a great fella. I think probably maybe the media were a bit to blame for what... They, they drove him mental. They wouldn't leave him alone, whatever he went or whatever he'd done. They just wouldn't leave him alone. Being here at Old Trafford at that particular time and George being amongst him, he was a smashing little fella. He was no different from any of the rest of us. Was he unlucky to be a good-looking Irishman and I dubbed... I think that was his biggest problem, being good-looking. <laughs> <laughs> being dubbed El Beatle after that great game against yeah. Benfica, was that the beginning of the end, perhaps? No, not really. I think the beginning of the end for George was when the team started getting a little bit older and there was a lot of pressure put on George that he was going to be the one that would have to do everything himself. Unfortunately, sometimes when you've got a great side, they stay together for a long, long period of time, maybe eight or nine, ten years, and then when you have to make a change, it's not, it's not one change, it's five or six at the same time, and it's difficult. Now, you were something of a father figure to George, and in fact, he ended up uh, living with your family for a time. That was the only way I could get out. <laughs> <laughs> no, George was... I mean, it's difficult to explain to people because people sometimes believe what the press write, and 
George wasn't what the press wrote about him. He was a lovely fella and a quiet lad, and I, I couldn't speak more highly of him. All the the things that he was supposed to have done in life just just weren't true. I was glad that I played with him uh, rather than against him. Uh, as a fullback, um, I think it must have been hell at times because I I, I can remember personally uh, players like. Um, John Angus ride back at Burnley. I always remember John Angus because he's a good friend of mine, come from the same part of the country. And and when you play against players uh, and you talk about them, you talk to them socially uh, before you actually play them. Uh, and and George Best, I always remember turning John Angus, who was then quite a hard, tough fullback, and he turned him inside out. Really, it was and it was embarrassing to see a friend embarrassed like that. Really, I mean, he was, he was. Um, the ball through his legs, going in the direction that he thought George was going in, but never did. And, and that's one of the first matches when George first came into the team uh, against a very strong, capable fullback. Who, uh, but but George didn't have any uh, illusions about it. He thought that he was a fantastic player, and it didn't matter who he was playing against. He, me, I had no esteem to anybody. He was going to beat them, and and it was quite quite impressive as a young player to see this happen. Embarrassing to to see your friends and humiliated sometimes, you know, but nevertheless, he was, uh, he was a fantastic little player. The, the problem with George was it never lasted long enough, but the, the period that he was here, I mean, he's, he's held in awe here, you see, by the people at that particular time because they'd never seen anything quite like it. And they were lucky that they saw it every week. And uh, he was always brave, always, always positive, always wanted to do things. Um, absolutely marvellous player. This football in the museum at Old Trafford is a lasting reminder to George of one of the more memorable moments in the best career. It's the ball used in United's fifth round FA Cup tie against Northampton Town in February 1970. United won 8-2, with Best celebrating his return from suspension in style, scoring a double hat-trick. Perrin, good ball to Kidd. Morgan's in the centre, Charlton's coming through, Best is there, and Best! A rank more for Northampton. Well cut out by Sadler. Ferrand and George Best through that run into his path beautifully. Book is committed and it's a goal. Charlton through to Kim. Best is in the middle and onside. Morgan is coming to bring support. Kid. Best, his hat trick. No, no. Brian Kidd. Best waiting, hopefully, in the middle again. Cut out by Brooks, but straight back to Kidd. Best, it's in. Sixteen minutes into the second half, and. George Best gets Manchester United's and his own fourth goal, 4-0 four Manchester United lead. Back header, Kidd! Number five from Brian Kidd. Burns quickly in the game. And putting Best through, and here goes Best, it must be his fifth, surely. Yes, he's rolled it in! This incredible player, his fifth goal of this game, his 19th of the season, Francis Burns, his first touch of the ball, strokes a beautiful through pass, and George Best does the rest. Nice ball from Best to Burns. Morgan here with a chance for another one. Saved, but it's scored now by Brian Kidd. Brian Kidd second. Edwards coming to challenge Felton. Kiernan and Clearand in again. To Best. Here he goes. And George Best sets a club scoring record. Six goals in a match. 
In part two of the program, there's more from George Best, Words and Goals. There's the Saint and Greavesy, as well as Pat Jennings and George's ex-wife, Angie. It's all in part two in a moment. In 1976, disenchanted with English football and tired of being hounded by the British press and media, Best headed west, taking his skills to the then booming soccer scene in America. He was to play five summers there, with Los Angeles Aztecs in California, Fort Lauderdale in Florida, before completing his soccer safari in the sunshine back in California with the earthquakes of San Jose. It was exciting because it, it was a new sport for them. They were bringing... You know, Pele was going there, Beckenbauer, Cruyff was there, uh, Niskins, you know, all the, Eusebio, all the best players in the world were going there. And it was nice to go there and be in at the start of something. It was really exciting. Uh, the Americans, when they put their mind to it, are the best in the world at presenting anything. Uh, and I was in on the ground floor, and it was big crowds, uh, the organisation. The, the razzmatazz was a little bit difficult to get used to. But that's the American way. So after a little while, you you know you just fell into uh, fell into it. But it was from my point of view, it was nice because I could walk down the street and nobody knew me. You know, apart from maybe the areas I was playing in, where they got to know you a little bit. But I could do normal things. You know, I wasn't getting in fights in the street with people driving me crazy. I could take the dog for a walk. I could go to the supermarket. So from that point of view, it was nice. And I made friends because of because of me, not because of what I was or who I was, because of me and. I've, actually, I've probably got more close friends in America than I've, than I've had here since I was 15. George, I think when we look back to your time of playing in America, I think everybody's still talking about that marvellous goal you scored for San Jose. Mm. Well, it's, it, was, it was just one of those things. I mean, I, I look at it today and I still don't know how. I, it was like watching somebody else. And actually NBC, I think, or one of the big American networks, actually showed it on, on their programme, which for them was, I mean, it's, I think it's the only time they've ever shown football, soccer as they called it. It was nice because I was playing against one of my former teams, the team I'd, previously, that I'd played for the season before. And we were losing 2-0 and uh, it was the playoffs. I mean, so if we lost, we were out. Uh, it was, I don't know, it was just one of those things. It just, you know, they kept disappearing. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know what it was. I'd, I, I remember watching it the first time and I was actually counting how many players. Uh, it was just one of those marvellous things. You know, it was, it was a one-off, you know, and even though it was it was in America, I remember someone saying once that in in this country when they they saw it, well he wasn't actually playing against any, but there there were, there were two lads in their team who played in English first division. They had a, a Chilean international, they had uh, a fellow called Cubius, played for Peru, who was brilliant. Uh, they had a couple of lads who played in English fourth division, and they can get stuck in as well. So I mean, it didn't matter if that had been on a on a, on a park with eight, seven and eight-year-olds, it still would have been a great goal. So it gave me a lot of pleasure. And uh, as I said, we were losing till I made it 2-1. And I scored the second goal, funny enough, went to overtime, and I hit the bar and centre forward knocked it in. So <laughs> the whole game, game, it wasn't a bad game overall, <laughs> yeah. In January 1978, George married English model Angela McDonald James in Las Vegas. They have a six-year-old son, Callum Milan Best. The couple are now divorced, but still friends, as we discovered on our visit to London two weeks ago, to Blondes Club in Mayfair. George is there to meet the customers, his management company has an interest in the club, and he also works for the club in a public relations capacity. Um, George is a man who very rarely says no to people. He's played in 150 testimonials that I can think of. He's never said no to anybody who needed him. And I don't think that the Irish people on a whole should say no when he needs them. I think that you should pay homage to him now while he's still here, not when he's dead. And uh, his good points are in, in, infathomable. I mean, you know him as a person. And to know him is to love him. He doesn't really have bad points. Either the most of the sons of Ireland have the bad points that George has, and that's an affliction which most of them have. Nine which one? Which is one we forgive, by the way. You are divorced, but uh, I do get the impression you're still very fond of the man. Oh, you can't help but be fond of him. At the same time you were playing in America, you were playing at uh, Fulham with Rodney Marsh. There didn't seem to be any pressures then at all. It seemed to be a very happy time. 
Well, R Roddy and I played the same way. We played for fun, you know, and we're both, I like to think, well, I know that Rodney says the same. We're, we're entertainers, apart from being footballers and sportsmen. And if, you know, I remember the games at, at Fulham, it was, it, it was fun. You know, we were laughing and joking and enjoying ourselves. And the fact that the cameras were turning up at games like, <laughs> we were playing Hereford, and there was 25,000 people there, and the cameras were there. You know, it was just, and I mean, Rodney came up with a classic of all time when, when he went to America about English football, said it was uh, a grey game played by grey people on grey days, you know, and that's what was happening to the game. And we came back, and for those short couple of years, everything was all, people were laughing, you know, the crowds were coming back, and we, we did it for fun. It was nice, and it was a couple, the two seasons we were there were, were tremendous. Best. Well, out for a shimmy. Through a yard of space. A delightful little chip there to Mitchell. Brilliant play again by George Best. Nicely placed pass again for Mitchell. Marsh. Watched it again. It'll come now through to Barrett. Marsh on the far side, wanting the cross. And yet another corner for Fulham. Well, it's all Fulham at the moment. With 20 minutes gone, no score. Barrett again with it. Ernie Howe up in there, Mitchell, Marsh. On the edge of the area is best. Carter getting it away. Cutlish. Slough. Mitchell sending a little dummy. Slough going through. That's the goal by Alan Slough. Lindsay now to Burrows. Oh, a bit of space there for Davy. He's gone through them. Is this the equaliser? Good save by Peter Mera. And Cutbush now to pass. Space ahead of him. Terry Payne coming back as hard as he can. Payne still after him. Still best going on. Tripped. Free kick. And Fulham quickly getting on with the game. The ball with Marsh. A touch now for Cutbush. Hit low there. And it'll come now for Evanson. Oh, a tremendous goal. 2 0. Best. the best. Oh my goodness, he hit the post. They're strong for Fulham. Best. Oh, what a ball there by Best to Marsh. And a beautiful save by Charlton and Marsh, jumping all over Burrows. ball for best. Now can he do the same? Onto the right foot. Mitchell on the far post. Marsh with the header. Best making his presence felt there again. Now it's John Evanson for Fuller. Played inside for Marsh. Looking around, seeing who he can pick up. Size to go on in. Oh my goodness, what a goal! Oh, what a tremendous goal by Marsh! Moore heading that one away. And now Marsh and Best are up. Best inside his own half. Marsh brought down. And Best on his way. Now he's got Tyler to beat. Oh, and in the end, Burroughs came up so quickly to dispossess him. And Marsh remonstrating with the referee that he was bowled over away in his own half. Strong and our best. Hurdle beautifully over Tyler. <laughs> Took it off Rodney Marsh. Marsh coming back to tackle him. Well, you can do that when you're 4 1 up. Here's Mitchell. Free kick right on the edge of the box, given away by Galley. Who's had a fairly rumbustious afternoon, this big number five of Hereford. A smile and they're cooking up something 
Well, the goalie will want a clear view of this. You can take my word for it. Best and Marsh will be cooking up something. And it almost came off in an unexpected way. Robbed up by Best. Hit by Marsh. In fact, there was a handball before it came to Ernie Howe. Here's Best again, from that pass by Marsh. Played on now for Mitchell. Marsh and Best are right up there. Curled it just wide. That is John Mitchell turning on the side a little bit. Mitchell. Best again. Now taking on Burrows. There's Best. Oh, and saved by Charlton and saved well. A couple of top strikers who played against Best were Scotland's Ian St John and England's Jimmy Greaves, better known nowadays as the Saint and Greavesy, two of television's most popular soccer pundits. I joined them in the Saint and Greavesy studio in London, and as you'd expect, the discussion had its lighter moments. But soccer's best-known double act also gave frank opinions about one of the world's top solo artists. We were all footballers, but he was a little bit special because he could do things, just spontaneous things that, that only a genius could do. And uh, I just feel very aggrieved that uh, George couldn't handle the situation he was in and play right through his career because we as, as fellow players at the time missed him when he left. And I'm sure the millions of fans, not only in the UK but around the world, missed uh, George Best on, on the big stages of the world, you know. And looking how it all went wrong for him, Jim, uh, do you feel he was unlucky being a good-looking Irishman with a twinkle in his eye? There's no such thing as a good-looking <laughs> Irishman, Jack. <laughs> looking Come at on. how you said that. <laughs> no, well, he might he have did. a twinkle in his eye, but that's <laughs> yeah. about it. Now, I feel uh, with George Best there was a problem from the off. I, I, you see, I, I've, I've got a feeling that, that there are a lot of people that can't carry the burden of being a genius and I think George Best was a genius. Well, I mean, you look at the, the great players of today, the Maradonas of the world, I mean, the pressure that that boy gets, I mean, all around the world, you know, I mean, he goes around with a dozen security guards, uh, but he's able to handle it. George was a born natural footballer who came from Ireland and I don't think he could live with the situation within himself, not with anybody else, but within the pressure built up in his own mind and his own body. Let's talk about the testimonial. The IFA said no. Public opinion back home in the main said yes. What's your opinion about it? Should he get one? Should he well, I, I would have said that if public opinion is on his side, then I would say, yeah, why not? I mean... Give anybody a testimonial if it's justified, as far as I'm concerned, if there's enough people ready to back the situation and uh, enough of the supporters in the man in the street who obviously wanted to see it and has been deprived of it, well, then I would have said, yeah, give George a testimonial. But testimonials, yeah. Jim, usually are uh, for players who have really put something into the game. And this is a testimonial, it's a thank you, isn't it? Now, you couldn't say that George really put an awful lot into the game for, for his country or his clubs, because he packed in when he was about 27 year old. And during that time, I mean, he went absent quite a bit and gave a, a lot of people some aggravation, you know, including Matt Busby and, and everybody else after that. Yes, so yes, that, in that yes. respect, now, but can I say this to you? If the people who are running his testimonial, who came up with the idea, did it as a nice little learner for George, 100 grand for George and themselves, uh, then I think that is wrong. If they wanted a testimonial for George to say, George, you were a great player, and all the other great players of the world would come and play in a testimonial match to your greatness, why didn't they then say, OK, the money goes to the hospital, Children's Hospital in Belfast? Eh? Do you think the, the, the FA would have turned that down? Do you think it would have got the support of the people? I'm sure it would do. What they don't want to do is to see George Best getting a nerner out of something where they feel that he didn't actually put an awful lot into it. Obviously, the powers to be that uh, don't, the general public, don't appear to be bothered. Um, well, they'd that, like Jim, to I, see you say George. that. I mean, that, George, George has had a lot of chances yeah. in life. Sure, I appreciate everything you're saying, Ian. All I'm saying, though, is when you say that he didn't give a lot to the game, you know, I saw one game of George Best is equivalent to 10 years of another player's mediocre performances who yeah. also earn a lot out of the game and really put very little back. What's no, left for George now? Eh? Yeah. What's left for George now? I don't know. I mean, as I say, I, I, that, that's the thing that bugged me about this. 
I think that the people were looking on it as a nice little few quid. Where I think if they'd have said, let's have a testament to George's ability from the football world and the money going to charity, I think we would all have supported it. First of all, I think a lot of people are under the impression that I actually asked for a testimonial. I didn't ask for a testimonial. Uh, the idea of a testimonial is basically that friends or people who want to say, say thank you to a certain player, whether it's me or someone else, get together and, and say thank you for whatever, for the pleasure you've given them or for the service you've given them. And that's basically the idea. I've, I've never asked for a testimonial. It's nice to, to think that uh, people want to put one on for you. And, uh, you know, I was no exception. I, I was, it was a great honour to think that people wanted to put in a lot of hard work and do something for me, uh, particularly in Belfast. Uh, the reaction from the people has been tremendous. I mean, I've had thousands. I mean, I can't tell you some of the people who've written to me uh, after hearing the decision. Uh, and to be quite honest, it's left a little bit of a, a sour taste because uh, I've always, well, you know, I, I've always, I mean, Belfast is my home and I've always uh, loved going home and had a great reception from the people. And I'd like to think that over the years, apart from the problems I've had personally, that I think the bottom line is I hope that I've always given them pleasure on the field. I've never begged in my life and <laughs> I'm not about to start now. Uh, as I say, it's, it's not for me. I mean, financially, obviously, you're talking about a lot of money. But money's never been my god, <laughs> and it, it never will be. Uh, if it goes ahead, I, I, st I would still like to think there's a possibility that something will happen. Uh, it'll happen somewhere. I know that. Uh, as far as we're concerned, we will make a, a further application to the IFA. I think it's in the interest of everyone that they should, in fact, uh, rescind their earlier decision and allow the game to go ahead. What was your reaction to that earlier decision? Very, very disappointed, but not shocked. Um, for some reason, I thought there was a strong possibility that the game would not be allowed to go ahead. Some people were saying it uh, was all about self-promotion for George Best. Did that upset you? Yes, very much so. Uh, the reason being that uh, you probably know the details as to how the, the whole testimonial game came about. And it was after Pat Jennings' game in Belfast that a group of prominent uh, footballing people in the north of Ireland approached us with a view to forming a committee uh, to allow the game to go ahead. And it was nothing to do with George. Obviously, he was very, very grateful that they had made the offer and had no hesitation in taking them up upon it. But having said that, there was no way did he self-promote it any more than anyone else would do under the same circumstances. These days, is he a happy person? He's happy in his own way. He's uh, a very complex person. I think you find this in any walk of life when you're dealing with a genius, irrespective of what they're doing. And George was a genius as a footballer. And he thinks and acts and behaves like a genius. Quite eccentric in his own way, but a tremendous guy with it. Looking at his international career, no one knew George better than goalkeeper Pat Jennings a legend in his own right who won 119 caps, a world record. Best, his roommate on Northern Ireland trips, only played 37 times for his country. Playing for Ireland, Georgie Best, who usually plays with Bobby Charlton for Manchester United. But this time, Charlton robs him of the ball. England force a corner, and Charlton's accurate kick is met by Martin Peters, who puts England in the lead with a driving downward header. It stayed like that until half-time. England were finding the Irish team hard to beat midfield, and they were sometimes struggling against well-planned Irish attacks. Then the equaliser came from Best, who beat Nobby Styles before crashing the ball into the net. You were his roommate in the early days with the international team, and you were a very close friend. What sort of a character was he then? Uh, basically the same fellas would have known now. Uh, very, very quiet fella. And uh, I don't think he's changed, it's just people's uh, attitude toward him has changed over the years. When he was at his peak as a player, how would you have rated him? Oh, uh, over the last 23 years, without a doubt, the best player I've seen. I'd put him well in a par with uh, Maradona, and I've played with him and against him in the last two years. Uh, just, as I say, in a class of his own. 
Uh, we've had our great players in this country, the Greaves, uh, Charlton's, Laws, and uh, George was definitely a pedestal above them. Well, I, I can never sort of say who's the greatest in football. How can you compare Pele, Maradona, Johan Cruyff and say that one of them is actually the greatest. You can't. But I would say that George Best lives alongside those names and there was never a better player than George Best. Did you see any signs of it going wrong for him, Dennis? I suppose maybe towards the late 60s, uh, when Samat, who had had a ter terrible in injury in the crash, you know, he wasn't uh, at his best. And maybe towards there when George started to sort of maybe go in the blink a little bit. Um, maybe Samat wasn't uh, sort of hard enough or tough enough, because I remember when I went on the blink in the early 60s, I soon got a wrap over the head. Matt was not too well, and maybe at that time he should have been, George should have been told maybe to calm down a little bit. People could see where he was going and were trying to warn him. People like Samad Busby, I, I presume, I'm no doubt he, he will tell you this. Um, tried to say that if you're not careful, this is what happened. And everybody hoped that George Best would never get into this situation, which he almost seems to be in now, you know, in a void out of the game, not really thought of a lot. Uh, and it's a tragedy, really. A lot of people have been critical of Matt Busby, and they've said he could have done more to help George. Do you believe that criticism is fair? Is fair? Well, maybe a, maybe a little bit. You know, maybe a little bit, but... Uh... It's so easy, you know, it's so difficult for people to understand that when you are in the public eye and everybody's patting you on the back, you know, it's, it isn't easy. And as I say, Samat so wasn't too well. Um, maybe we should have all helped a bit, but, you know, we've got our own life to lead as well. He was a terrific player. He, he did, the one thing he did do, whatever was said about him, when he went on the pitch, he, as they say in the trade, he did the business. And really that what it was all about. So there's no blame to anybody. I don't think any... I don't think anything would have changed, or would change, if he had to have his life over again. I was Football of the Year in 73, and straight away that brings more pressure. So, uh, from that point of view, I could see just what he was going through, having to play to uh, the pressures of being the best football in the country. I had it for a year, a couple of years, but he had it week in, week out for all the years that he played. Would you be critical, though, because he couldn't withstand those pressures? And after all, you did. You were at the top for, for over 20 years. Yeah, no, I'd never be critical of something like Best. But, uh, no, it's very, very hard for... I mean, I would think probably that the problems that maybe Manchester United had at that time, they were going through a very bad spell. And I would say that he kept them in the first division for a couple of years on his own. And I think that was probably his best time. And perhaps maybe he felt that he should have been playing in uh, European competitions uh, every other week. And I think probably that's our number one, isn't it? You've done many things, you've achieved many things. You've also had your problems, which have been well chronicled. Mm -hmm. Have you enjoyed life in the fast lane or have you regrets? I've enjoyed life in the fast lane and now I'm enjoying it in the bus lane. <laughs> I've, I've, I've good times and bad times, but I think at the end of the day, I'll always remember the good times. The bad times, I, I try and put them out of my mind. Uh, the old problem, the drink problem, is always going to be there. I mean, I don't kid myself anymore. I used to think, I'll beat it one day. I don't, I don't worry about it now. If I beat it, I'll beat it. If I don't, I don't. And uh, I, I'd rather think like that than drive myself crazy worrying about it. In this programme, we've seen the best genius. But what if he was playing today? Would he fit into the modern game? Would he enjoy it? And what would his value be on the transfer market? You couldn't buy him today. When I see the likes of somebody was quoting John Barnes as good as George Best, you know, it's, it's a great player, George, John Barnes, and a highly exciting player, and he was a million pound. No comparison. To have a skill like that, I mean, they, they would pull the stadium down, probably, if, if he was here and you actually thought of selling him. At that particular time, it was just unheard of and uh, you couldn't put a value on him. Uh, the way that it seems to have gone, I think it probably is more than likely that he would have been tempted abroad. Uh, in which case, at the present time, you know, you're talking about a few million pounds, a good few million pounds. Dear, dear, well, when you see some of the players being transferred for, I don't know, two million, three million, Josh Best is probably in the top 
say, six players that the game has ever seen as being one of the top six. So if Maradona is worth uh, five million, George Best got to be worth five million. It wasn't the word to start. I mean, in the early days, there was players like uh, the lad Daly at Wolverhampton, uh, Robson, uh, Andy Gray. They went, what, 10, 12 years ago for a million and a half. I wouldn't have a clue, you know. I would say probably five million, cheap at the price. We're talking about 10, 12 years ago. When one looks at Maradona uh, being sold for five, six million pound, I would say George would be at least worth 10 million pound. I'll give you an example of the sort of esteem in which George is held. Maradona was travelling over from Italy to watch England and Brazil and I know on very good authority that the first question that he asked when he got on the plane to come here was could I please meet George Best? How would you like to be remembered? Um, as the greatest footballer I've ever played and Pelle said I was so that's good enough for me. <laughs> Georgie, Georgie, they call you the Belfast boy Georgie, Georgie Call you the Belfast boy. They say, Georgie, Georgie, keep your feet on the ground. Georgie, Georgie, when you listen to the sound. Georgie, Georgie, put a light on your name. Hey, 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 play the game.